Okay, okay, Sean Thomas here with AO, and we are going to do another mentor session. We've got some questions going back to March 25th. Sorry it's taken so long for me to get to this, but we are ready to go. We are ready. Let's do this. Okay, the first question. This question comes in from Karina, and Karina says, what factors would you take into consideration when deciding between working on your own hustle versus with your spouse on their business. My husband runs his own videography business that did approximately 250,000 in 2020. He has no employees, only contractors, no CRM, and does almost all administrative tasks manually. My experience is in administration and operations management, so fixing these things, setting up systems and running the behind the scenes are all strengths of mine. That being said, working with a spouse seems like it could have additional challenges I am not fully aware of. Okay, good question here, Karina. In the resource center here in AO, I believe that I set up a category specifically called family business. Would recommend reading those articles. Yes, there are challenges that I have seen in mentoring a couple people over the years that are in family businesses that it really requires great communication really great communication, um, which means if I was going to do that, I would also have both parties buy in that it's going to take both parties learning how to communicate effectively in order to have a productive and loving and caring environment for the two of you with laid out specificity of roles so that if you're going to be working with the team that the team sees you as a boss or a partner just like they do him. Uh, so there's lots of things to do there. Um, I think it's a fantastic thing personally to work with somebody that you're in a relationship with and you guys are building something together and getting the mutual benefit of it as long as it's not looked as though one of you is bossing the others but you guys are in partnership together, which takes a lot of deep dive coaching possibly between the two of you or sometimes it might just be perfect i don't know it just depends on y'all's relationship but there are some things to work on on both sides to make sure both people feel equally yoked in the business um, otherwise maybe you could do some things to help your husband's business while also building up your side hustle business on the side if that would keep peace at home something to think about Something to think about. Those of you that are in here, would you leave a comment and just make sure that you can hear me okay? Thanks. Hope that answered your question. Okay, Karina. Um, the next question comes from... And Karina, I'm not sure if I already answered that one, but... Uh, the next question I have coming from Ashley... And Ashley says, any advice on setting prices for different services, niches you serve? Actually, I think I already answered that one too. You know, there might be some questions I already answered here. I wonder if I already answered that one. Give me a second here. I don't know if I answered that for Ashley, so I'm gonna go ahead and answer it anyways. So this question comes from Ashley, and Ashley says, any advice on setting prices for different services and niches you offer? I own a residential and commercial cleaning business. Residential, I charge 35 an hour plus HST. Commercial, depending on office size, I normally charge $55 an hour. Major box doors, I charge $40 a square foot. My friend the other day asked me to give a quote to his boss. Going in, I thought it was one store once a week. Finding out that it's three stores every day of the week, this threw my pricing out of whack. I didn't know how to charge. I already shot him a quote. I definitely think I lowballed myself, wondering how I can finalize and structure my pricing better. Okay, when I'm looking at pricing my products and services, I look to the marketplace to determine if there are any other companies providing a service similar to mine. Of course, it's not going to be as good as mine, but similar to mine and what their rates are, what their a la carte rates are, what their group discount rates are, 
um, what their service level agreement entails. Because if somebody says, hey, I'm going to come do a commercial cleaning for you, it might include ABC, but yours includes ABCDEFG. So I always want to make sure I understand the marketplace when I'm creating my services that I'm going to offer. Because many times a prospect is going to go get bids from multiple providers and I want to know in my sales process what makes me unique, what makes me better than my competition, and why somebody should go with me over somebody else. And that's going to reflect in my pricing. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be the cheapest, but if I'm charging a, at the high end of the scale, then I want to make sure a client knows why and why that's beneficial to them. And maybe sometimes in my negotiation, they might be able to say, well, you know, you're at this rate, this high rate, but I only need these. Can, if I take this stuff out, could I do this? And then that leaves you with some negotiations. So those are some things to take into consideration as well. But the market in the industry is going to tell you the range of what the rates are. And then it's up to you to figure out where you fall within that range. If you are the best of the best, then you should get the top of the top rate. So that's how it usually goes. If you're going to be at the low end, it's because you're doing the low end side of the services. Something to think about, okay, Ashley? Um, that would be a great question to get on the weekly live with both Dan Abate when he goes live on business operations and processes, and then also with Jeff on a CFO side to talk about numbers. And then you also might want to jump on the next one with Tom, who's our sales uh, coach, he does a, a monthly Zoom as well, and you can get in there and ask these type of sales questions to him as well. Um, these are where you guys as members, I'm talking to all of you now watching this, even on the replay, these weekly lives, you are talking to people that have built $10 million businesses and above, and you get them as part of being an AO to be able to have conversation and dialogue as part of your $99 monthly fee. Take advantage of this stuff. This is your chance to really get the advice and help that you need in your business. Okay? Awesome. Thanks, Carrington. Okay, next question comes from Ashley Watkins. And Ashley says, when hiring other coaches to scale a coaching business, should they be partners, independent contractors, or employees? The background is I launched a coaching business this year to help startups organize, strategize, and digitally market their business. I have been helping clients one-on-one -on -one walk through their planning phase, set goals, and put together digital marketing strategies. So far, my clients love the mindset work and business strategies. I'm like a little version of AO in my own way. I am looking for ways to scale this, so I'm switching to a membership and subscription model. However, as I put together my service hierarchy, I would still like to offer premium one-on-one -on -one coaching for those who want it. I'm thinking I could train other coaching to walk business owners through stages, but would these coaches be employees or independent contractors? Okay, uh, to answer your question, they would be independent contractors, not employees, because they're off doing their own things. So, uh, they're going to be they're going to be independent contractors, and you're going to have a, a services agreement between your company and them, spelling out what you're going to pay them, what they're what you're going to get, and so forth. Um, so that's that answers that question. Um, when I was reading your well, your background here, that you help clients with planning, set goals, digital marketing strategies. Those are almost all multi-million dollar companies all within themselves. And so for one coach to be helping somebody master and get through all of those phases, man, I hope you're charging your clients 50 grand a year per client because those are big time things that you are one-on-one -on -one helping your clients through. The strategy side just in itself is a $10,000 a year coaching gig. Helping somebody with digital marketing strategies, I pay my digital marketing company four grand a month. Like this is this is high level stuff here that you're helping clients through. So I would urge you to take a look at your value stack and determine what part could you be doing that's making the most bang for its buck and then how can you bring on other people on your team so you can provide more because that's a lot of information to be providing to clients. Um, but I think it's fantastic. But those are all individual businesses just in their own, um, in their own planning strategy. That's a business. 
setting goals and accountability and operations and all that stuff, that's a business. Digital marketing strategies can be a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar business in itself. So food for thought. Hope that helps, Ashley. All right, the next question comes from Corey Stevens. And Corey and I spoke about this a little bit. How can I create content on social media that speaks directly to my ideal client? The background is I'm a distributor of a medical grade water ionizer, which is a high ticket item. It is also high end commission. My bio on Instagram and LinkedIn is helping health and fitness coaches increase their revenue by leveraging their current client base. I am looking for people in the health or fitness industry to come be a part of my team. So how would I go about speaking directly to them through my content on social media? How would I hit on their pain, problem, and other them to solution to that? I think you had a typo there. Okay, so let me speak, speak a little plainer on this. So Corey is in the multi-level marketing network industry and the product that he markets through this multi-level marketing company is a water ionizer and it's and it is a high ticket item but there's a big commission in it. Um, so I think that learning how to craft your elevator pitch and what you do and who you do it for is very important and we talked about this and I got you some resources on this. When we're putting together so this is a this is something I talked about on my branding weekly Zoom this week. A lot of people try to go into marketing before they've done their branding, and that's why they're feeling the way you do, Corey. You're trying to go out there and market, and you don't even know what your brand message is, what your brand mission, vision, core values, unique selling proposition, ideal client. You don't have to know all those things foundationally, like perfect, and you're skipping all that and going right into marketing. If you had all of this brand strategy foundational stuff done then you would know how to go out there and put together content from a marketing perspective now listen when you're putting together marketing content you're going to need graphic design skills you're going to need video editors and video videography skills because think about what marketing is marketing is visual right and it's audio so you're going to need to know how to graphically design and to do videos that are appealing to your audience. And the better those look and feel and just are, the more they're going to resonate with your audience and attract people to come do business with you. That's why you see the commercials on TV and the high-end influencers on social media. They're usually people that have really, really amazing content because they're spending a lot of money to hire great photographers or they learn how to do it themselves. Not everybody can learn it. Like I, I, don't, ha I don't have that skill and I really don't wanna learn that skill. I would just hire somebody. So creating content is derived from what is your mission, what is your vision, what is your unique selling proposition, who is your ideal client and how do we appeal to them? Okay, great, here's an idea for a commercial. Here's an idea for some content. Here's some idea for some photography. Here's some idea for the types of content that are going to attract those people. And that's part of an ongoing marketing strategy. Really, really difficult for one person, especially as young as you are. It's really difficult for any one person to master all of that, which is why we hire people to help us do that. Um, so, yeah, that's... That's the rub there with, with being in multi-level marketing and trying to use social media in order to attract business. We have to learn all this other stuff about marketing just to get there and build an audience. And it takes time to learn how to do it. And then it takes time to consistently put out great content and network with people on social media and provide value to get them to trust us enough to buy from us. Um, you know, so that's, the answer to your question, how do you create content? You have to know how to do graphic design. You have to know how to place your videos. You have to be great on video, which means you have to be a great speaker. Think about the people that are killing it on social media. They're great speakers. They understand their brand, what kind of humor, what kind of sarcasm, what kind of value, what kind of straightforwardness. They know what really people want from them and they give it to them. This is all really, really complex stuff 
that the people that are really good at it, they make it look easy. Um, I hope that helps. Thanks, Corey. Okay, the next question comes from The next question comes from Nicole, and Nicole says, is there a checklist, for lack of a better word, I can use to make sure I'm covering all bases as I start a partnership with a complementary business? The background is I am a life habit strategist and help clients create better habits that lead to permanent weight loss, better eating habits, better morning and evening routines, stress and anxiety reduction, better sense of self and trust. I'm partnering with a local fitness person as I do not have a fitness component to my program. We're creating a separate business name and will conduct workshops and programs that incorporate both of our services. That means payment could either go to each of us separately for a joint gig or we can create a separate PayPal or something for joint payments, etc. I know there are a bunch of legal things to consider. Just want a place to start. Thank you. Ooh, that is a tough, tough one, Nicole. If it were me and I was doing this, I would not create an LLC that both of us own and are partners in. I would have my company, they would have their company, and, and when money came in, I would have an agreement between our two companies of what the split's going to be, that if I send them business, they're going to pay me X. If they send me business, I'm going to pay them X. But I would wait f for a while, if it's even needed, in order to go into business together and start a company in which all the monies come through the company. If you guys are going to run separate companies and then have another one to filter money, that's a recipe for disaster late, later on or even in the beginning. <clears throat> um, but the bottom line is, is, to answer your question, no, there's not a checklist. Some of the things that we've talked about in the past, if you just search the Q and A's that we've done in the weekly recaps. I think Sharon, I had Sharon Lecter answer this question for you last week. You want to figure if you know if you're going to go into business where you each own membership in that LLC, then what happens if one of you dies? What happens if one of you starts stops participating in the business? Do they still own part of that business? What happens? Um, can anybody write a check from that business? Like, how is money dispersed? How do you control? who controls the money. Um, those are the initial things that come into play. Um, how do you make decisions on part of the company? What does the company do? Um, can one of the people bring in another partner or does that have that require approval from both of you? Um, what happens if you guys decide to walk? How do you get your shares back? So a buy-sell agreement. I really think that you'd be spending way more time and money putting together an agreement like that that, when, that you could just form, a, form some sort of mutual agreement between the two of you of what you're going to pay each other for the different services that you provide and handle it that way. Um, you know, I send coaching business to Dan and Joel and Peter and Tom and other people and sometimes they will pay me a commission. Sometimes I'm just doing, we're just doing business for each other. Um, but we don't have a company that we're creating to have to worry about all that type of stuff. And I think in your situation, you could do the same thing without having to create another company, if you will. Just work out a trusting relationship where you have reciprocity in sending each other business and what the split's going to be. Um, that would be my recommendation. It'd be what I would do. Hope that helps. Okay, the next question comes from Simon. What's up, Simon? And Simon says, can it be profitable to run a food truck business in Switzerland in high summer season this year? If so, what would be the correct analysis that should be done and then the corresponding business plan? Background, I live in a very touristy city in Switzerland and where it is also close to other highly tourist cities. I have experience in food trucks and cooking meats. The idea would be to make a food truck with Argentinian foods, different types of meats and sandwiches, and other things like empanadas and hot dogs. Since I am Argentine and with my family, we have a butcher shop and cooking events there. So the idea would be basically copy these businesses from Argentina to Switzerland, starting with a food truck. 
So are you saying that, I'm trying to guess, do you have a butcher shop and, and family in Switzerland and then you could be an extension of that with the food truck? Or are you just using your experience back in Argentina where the butcher shop was and just kind of to create that idea of a food truck in Switzerland? You know, listen, the bottom line is, is if I was going to create a food truck anywhere in the world, I'd have to find out what the cost is for the truck and all of the different things it would it would take to brand that truck and get the truck, you know, up to speed on being able to actually cook out of it. I'd have to find out what licenses and insurance are and are required by the city or country in order to provide that service find out how what kind of accounting has to be done for the money in order to pay taxes if taxes so that I know what I need to be charging in order to make a profit in the business I'd want to scout out all the different areas in which a food truck is able to be run in that city and what are what are the the legalities and the politicalness sometimes of being able to even get the truck to be able to be in there because I know that sometimes they only hand out a certain amount of licenses for a certain amount of areas. So is there politics involved? What does it take to be able to do all that stuff? Then if there are groups of places where food trucks are in Switzerland where you want to do this, I would want to camp out there for weeks and get a little iPad or a clipboard and I would want to talk to as many people who are buying food from all of these different food trucks and find out what they like about the offerings that are there what kind of food would they like to see would they consider a good Argentinian place to be something that they would pay for how much do they spend how often do they come there all those types I want to do my own little market research to, to solidify that there's enough demand for another food truck and if they would want Argentinian food. I don't want to just rely on, I think this would work. I want to get as much data as I can in making that decision. Hope that helps, Simon. I like that question. Okay, the next question comes from Sanal. And Sanal says, if you have some extra cash in business in the business, what would be your next move to grow the business? Background is I'm in title searching business. We provide B2B services. Our clients are title insurance companies. Love this question. When I have extra cash and I want to grow the business, the next growth is going to be in sales and marketing. I want to get more salespeople or do more marketing or both in order to grow the business. And then when more cash flow and more business is coming in, I want to make sure I have the capital and cash flow, obviously, to hire the operational people that I'm going to need to fulfill all the new business that's coming in. Uh, We've talked about this and all. You're going to hire Tom Black as your coach. You and I had a good conversation on this just this morning. So I'm super excited that you're going to invest in your business and hire Tom. And then when you're ready and you need help on the operational side, we're going to connect you with Dan and Dan can help you on the operational side to make sure you've got enough operational people to handle the influx of new business that you've got coming in. Love that question. Sales and marketing first, always. Okay, next question comes from Jessica. I think this is Jessica's first question. Hope you're doing great, Jessica. Jessica's question is, how can I determine my target audience? What if I have more than one? How can I go about reaching different target groups? The background is my business is in wellness. My business is a wellness company specializing in yoga, meditation, and mindfulness. I think it's fantastic to have different types of target groups. The best way to determine your target audience is yourself. Who needs the types of services that I want to offer and who are the people that I want to work with? Because sometimes we might not want to work with everybody who might want our, want our products and services. Sometimes we might want to work with a certain demographic. Like there are some people that only want to work with other women. They only want women clients. Some people want only guy clients. Some people only want certain religious types. Some only want certain ethnicities. Some people want, you know, certain, that's up to you to decide what target audience that you want to work with, right? And then if you have more than one, when you're going to go about reaching them and targeting them, 
basically what I want to do is where are they? Like I want to know what's called my buyer persona, which would include everything that goes into that buyer. What do they do to make a buying decision to get a product or service like mine? Where do they go? What books do they read? What magazines do they read? What Facebook groups are they in? What Instagram accounts are they watching? What social media platforms are they on? I want and and where you know where are they? That is where I want to be. Wherever my target audience is, that's where I want to be. Hope that helps. And it is okay to have multiple target audiences for different products and services and different marketing sales and marketing strategies going at once. Okay, the next question comes from Cheston and Cheston says, "How can I get better at finding, hiring and engaging resources and people to help me carry my vision forward so I can finally get out of the business of doing everything for the business?" The background is I'm trying to build a software as a service platform while trying to keep my existing digital marketing agency afloat just enough to continue generating the monthly revenue I need. I want to get to a point I can either completely offload the digital marketing work or engage others to help build out my SaaS vision. How can I get better at finding and evaluating and delegating all the work that needs to be done? I find myself stuck doing tasks I know I shouldn't be doing, but I've been unable to find or provide sufficient instruction, guidance and structure uh, to resources and people capable of helping. You know, Cheston, that those are some very I get the understanding from a frustration perspective, but to answer your question, I'd need to know a little bit more specificity of exactly the type of people that you're needing. You know, the bottom line is is it's easy to document the things that we do. You can use Loom, which is a software platform, L O O M, and that allows you to basically screen uh, record everything that you do on your screen and talk into a microphone, which I've got right here, and explain everything that you're doing. And then document that as a process. So when you hire somebody and you say, I want to train you on how to do this, watch this video, read these step-by-step -step instructions, and then they know how to do it, right? And you can document those processes in a software called Trainual, T-R-A-I-N-U-A-L, trainual.com use discount code AO10 to get a 10% discount on their monthly fee it's like a hundred bucks a month and that way when you get a new employee in or a new 1099 worker and you want them to do all this set of tasks you basically just get them their login and tell them here are the trainings that I want you to watch and then I'm gonna test you on them and you don't have to spend the hours and hours and hours training them and then and then all you have to do is test them to make sure they know what they're doing and if all they're doing is following the step-by-step -step process that you put together now where do you find these people it depends on the type of people that you're trying to find if you're trying to find software developers graphic designers video editors and things like that you can find those people on upwork u-p-w-o-r-k upwork.com very easy you want to just basically be sure that you're specifying exactly the skill set that you need in somebody and then what tasks you're going to be giving them so that you can have your weekly meetings with them to say this is what I want you to do this week here based on the hourly wage it's all done through Upwork super simple if you're trying to find salespeople you might want to get with Tom Black on that on one of his monthly Zooms and ask him what software or other type of networking or recruiting strategies you can use to attract salespeople. Usually that's going to be word of mouth, your existing network. There are some websites called Sales Gravy that you can use, but Tom would be really good on that. So it really depends on the type of people you're looking to hire for me to tell you where you can go find them. But that's how you can get better at finding and, and hiring people is create a great culture, have your core values, have your story, have your vision, have your mission, all the things that you're going to use to explain what your company does, and then have a great onboarding process with great documented training processes, and then set them up for success.
just that easy. We've got a leadership mastermind where we're going to do a complete deep dive weekend mastermind on leadership, team building, processes and things in June. If you want to come to that, shoot me a message, get get a hold of me through Shirley and I can get you the details on that. But it is a deep dive massively amazing weekend to where we're going to, this is one of my favorite weekends. So um, let me know if you want to come to that. Okay, the next question comes from Brad Coleman. And Brad says, what do you recommend for a guide on how to post via social media? Tips, tricks, books to follow. Uh, the background is um, I own an e-commerce luxury brand and I would like to know your input on posting for social channels. Uh, any recommendations? Books, guides, channels to follow for tips. Um, I don't know of any books. Um, as far as tips and tricks, I know within the Resource Center under social media, I believe. In fact, I'm going to look right now and make sure that it's in there, Brad, okay? Give me one second. Because I believe in the portal that I added... Gosh, I love this new portal login. It looks so good. The, the, the dashboard looks so good. I hope everybody's logged into the portal. This looks awesome. So I'm going into the portal. I'm going into the resource center and I'm going into social media. There are six, there are six things in social media. Um, I would go through all of this stuff right here. There is, there's a guide, the ultimate guide to writing Instagram um, captions, the stories of making money online have disappeared. Why is that? Um, the best tips from influencers. Go through these, Brad. Um, but I'll also tell you that when you're going to create content, you got to have a great brand strategy to give to your content creators in order to know what to create. You've had you have to have a fully done brand um, identity kit with all your logos, color palette, font, all that imagery that you're going to use. You're also going to need to know your brand voice so that when your copywriter is writing copy for your posts, they know what voice to use. Like, are you an Andy Frisella where you're like, F this, F that? Or are you a more corporate uh, brand that's very straight laced? So there's a voice that you're going to have to create within your brand. You're going to need a graphic designer, some video editors, and then you can use software platforms like Planoly, P-L-A-N-O-L-Y.com. That's a, 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 um, a software that you can use to batch content that can help you post. There's a software platform called Hootsuite, H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E. Um, those are great. So those are some of the tips and tricks that I've got on social media but you you're really looking to create a marketing strategy which is going to mean that your website's got to be perfectly set up with SEO your Facebook pixel is ready to go you've got an advertising marketing strategy ready to go which means you've got the right uh, graphic uh, 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 your uh, graphics videos all those things are all ready to go before you get started and I'm going through and have just gone through this process with AO, so that's what I had to do. I got my brand strategy stuff done. We're building out our corporate website for our SEO strategy. We're doing brand awareness right now on so on Facebook and Instagram. We're going to have an SEO strategy. Then we're really going to start heavily targeting uh, uh, ads on, on social media uh, and SEO. So this is all the stuff that goes into creating a great marketing program, okay? Remember... Social media is marketing, which means you have to have a strategy and you also have to have the foundation and structure in place to handle the marketing that's coming in. All right. I hope that helps. Okay. The next question and the last question comes from, oh, that was the last question. Brad, that was the last question because Justin resubmitted. So hopefully got you covered there, Chestnut, on the, on the previous one. You're good to go. Whew, that was a good session there. Lots of good, good questions. Um, I think that's it. So for those of you that are still watching, Wendy, Carrington, hope you guys got something out of this. Hope that 
that uh, evokes you guys to ask some more questions. And you'll be getting an email from each of you that asks a question. You're going to get an email from Honey, my assistant, telling you what other mentors I'm going to have answer these questions. And you're going to get a link directly to go to the spot in the video where I'm answering your question now if you didn't watch it live. All right. Hope you guys have a great day, morning or night, wherever you are in the world. And I'll see you very, very soon. Peace out. Adios.